Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to do my birthday book haul, which as you might be able to expect, is probably one of the biggest book hauls that I ever do on my channel in any given year. And this year is no exception. All through the month of March, I'm constantly just justifying being able to buy things because you know, it's my birthday. So even though I don't believe that I received that many books this year, I still have accumulated quite quite a little collection. So because I can already feel that this video is going to be quite long indeed, I think I just need to get straight into the books. I started off March by picking up a couple of quite anticipated release books. One of them I was able to justify quite well because it is very relevant for Herstoryathon, which is the read-along that myself and Brittany over at Literally Smitten host every March. And that book was The Once and Future Sex by Eleanor Yeniger, Going Medieval on Women's Roles in Society. So this is very much giving a general history of women in the Middle Ages and particularly the expectations of them, whether that is in terms of how they should appear, how they should act, what kind of work is acceptable. Eleanor Yeniger had recently done the text for an icon books graphic novel, graphic history of the Middle Ages and I really really enjoyed that and so I had to snatch this up and I read it straight away. I think it is a really really brilliant non-fiction and we'll speak more about this in my history a -thon wrap up. The other big anticipated history release for me was Uproar, Satire, Scandal and Printmakers in Georgian London by Alice Loxton. So this is a book all about the 18th century, the late 18th century, particularly focusing on the satirists, the printmakers, caricaturists of this time period who lampooned many a famous figure. The figure who most likely will spring to mind is James Gilray and this is basically Alice Loxton going through this history, going through these prints and basically asking why it is that these figures are not more well known. I was really excited to read this because during my master's program I did a module on representing women in the 18th century and caricaturists and satire and print was featured on one of those weeks and I found myself going down a bit of a James Gilray rabbit hole and while there are loads of coffee table books that you can buy about James Gilray there aren't really like popular histories that you can read until now so I'm really really hoping that this book ends up taking off and becomes huge because I think this is just a history that needs to be told. Also during March I went to a talk with Alice Loxton and another person who I will speak about towards the end of this video and so of course I had to bring my book and she did sign it for me so that was really really lovely. I also managed to find a matching bookmark to go with this. I'm very pleased about that. Another history thon related book that I picked up, one that was also on my new to me video that I ended up picking up was Blood Sisters, The Women Behind the Wars of the Roses by Sarah Gristwood. And this book does basically do what it says on the tin. It talks about the women, particularly in 15th century England, the women behind the Wars of the Roses, figures like Margaret of Anjou, Elizabeth Woodville, Margaret Beaufort, Elizabeth of York, and many more that probably I've not come across before. It's really interesting reading this one because I believe that this came out towards like September of 2012, maybe August, and it's very evident about this because she talks about how there has been rumblings, discussions that Richard III's bones might be found, and who knows if this is actually going to happen, and I'm sat here like 11 years later reading this like, oh, <laughs> yes it does. <laughs> And I don't know if anybody else feels like that, but I find it very weird reading War of the Roses histories that were pre-2012 for that very reason, because, you know, there's just so much that people didn't know about that has been discovered because of the finding of these bones. I don't think I'm making any sense saying that, but it, yeah, I'm finding it really fascinating to read, even though those beginning chapters have made me just like lose my brain a little bit. <laughs> Next up, moving on to fiction, we have Medusa by Jesse Burton. I've previously read The Miniaturist and The Confession by Jesse Burton, but I've never read any of of her children's or YA and this is very much a YA retelling of the myth of Medusa. I imagine going to be portraying her quite sympathetically. This is one I saw when it came out in hardback but I thought I'll wait until this one comes out in paperback. I think it's just a really gorgeous gorgeous paperback and now that I also have a copy of Stoneblind by Natalie Haynes which is also a Medusa retelling I am wondering if I should talk about these two books back to back, kind of compare and contrast. You know me, I can never miss a good Greek myth retelling, so do let me know what you think of this. Back to the history thon books, we have Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shetterly, talking particularly about the black women who worked for NASA, working on the space program and particularly trying to get a man into space. We're focusing particularly on the 1950s, 1960s, so not only is there a massive shift in terms of technology, this is obviously during the Cold War, there is a massive pressure on NASA to be able to compete with Russia, but also at this time the Civil 
civil rights movement is occurring. And in the middle of all this are these incredible gifted intelligent women working as human computers calculating the mathematics that is going to be required for all of these experiments whilst also living their lives in a society that was still trying to keep them very much segregated and on the sidelines. For me personally this was not a history that I knew anything about until the film came out a few years ago. I thought it was a fantastic film and so I really wanted to learn more about it so I'm really glad that I picked this up during Historyathon. A bit of a rogue book choice that I picked up at a charity shop in New York around my birthday was The Child That Books Built, A Memoir of Childhood and Reading by Francis Spufford. You can see it's quite a quite an old dusty book. And yeah I think this is just the author's essays and reflections on their childhood of reading. I read previously Bookworm by Lucy Mangan which was also a childhood reading memoir and to be honest with you I wasn't that much of a fan of it. I think partially because I just didn't know a lot of the books and I think that can sometimes happen with reading books about books. If you're not very familiar with them it can kind of scupper your enjoyment. It's like I don't get that reference. So I'm hoping that this one is going to be a bit more reflective just of the practice of reading rather than particularly the books themselves and being very very specific. I mean it's always nice to get recommendations but yeah that's kind of what I'm hoping for with this one. We'll see how we go. A fiction book on a very different tract is Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. This was one gifted to me from Shah over at Thoroughly Enjoyed Books so thank you very much Shah. She knows that I've been on a bit of a romance reading kick and here we have a historical romance set in the Victorian period. We've got the main character of Annabelle who is studying at Oxford. Well, obviously in a time period where women's study and particularly votes for women were not just contested but just flat out ignored and not taken seriously. Evie is part of a suffragist movement and they decide that they're going to campaign specific prominent political figures and she gets tasked with having to convince Sebastian Devereux who is a duke who has recently been appointed chief advisor to the Tory party. So she and her friends end up wrangling an invitation to his home spending weeks with him and it becomes very apparent that they are very attracted to each other but how is this attraction to each other going to interfere with each other's aims? A book that I was gifted by my sister was Hidden Hands by Mary Wellesley, The Lives of Manuscripts and Their Makers. This is one that I was really keen to pick up as soon as I found out about it but of course I'm always one to wait for the paperback to come out. So I'm glad that I did wait for this one but I'm also just like I want to read this now. <laughs> Basically looking particularly at medieval manuscripts and the lives that were being lived around them. Obviously before the rise of the printing press any literature was written painstakingly by hand. It was a very long process and we often think much about you know the authors of those works but not very much about the manuscript writers, the people who were creating these works. I think people would also be very surprised to know how many women were involved in this. I think when people think of the medieval period they think well there was a small amount of men who were able to read and write but the majority weren't and the percentage of women was even smaller. So you'd probably be surprised to know that a good chunk of manuscript copiers were actually women but our traces of them are minuscule. I think particularly Mary Wellesley is going to be looking at like marginalia so the little drawings and commentary that is written around the texts that they were writing out. Also another part of this is that you know fire, destruction, water damage, so much can impact what sources are actually available to us and so yeah I feel like there's going to be a lot to unpack in here I'm very excited to read this. While I was at home I actually popped over to Manchester because something I've been wanting to do for a very long time something that's been on my bucket list and I just had never checked off was going to the Elizabeth Gaskell house. I really love Elizabeth Gaskell she is probably my favourite Victorian author that I've read but I actually didn't know a whole lot about her life aside from her friendship with Charlotte Bronte so I had a really really great time going to her home learning more about her and I decided at the end of that I was going to pick up some of her fiction I actually wanted to pick up a biography. So we have Elizabeth Gaskell by Jenny Uglo. Quite a chunky little thing and to be honest with you I don't know a whole lot about Elizabeth Gaskell literature and scholarship so you will have to tell me if you think this was a good option for me. And yeah I don't know what else to say about this you know I'm, I am very much looking forward to learning more about her life. Another chunky biography that I picked up that I'm very excited to read is The Lonely Empress Elizabeth of Austria by Joan Haslip. I picked this up in one of the Oxfam bookshops in York and to be honest with you the last time I went to York was back in March 2022 so around a year ago so pretty much exactly a year ago I went for my birthday and I'm pretty sure that I saw this book there too. I don't know if it's the exact same copy but I have a feeling it might be. Apparently there have been no takers for Elizabeth of Austria which seems very odd because I know that there have been like two big adaptations about her life. Elizabeth of Austria is somebody who I do find really fascinating but I've never read a whole biography off. It's somebody I've always wanted to learn a bit more about and I've had this particular biography on my wish list for a very long time but just thought you know eventually you'll get around to it. But because I had seen it twice I thought 
you know what, I think now is the time. She had a really interesting life, but also incredibly tragic, very sad, and it had a brutal, bloody end. So as sad as it will be to learn more about her life, I think she's somebody who I do need to know more about. As I say, particularly when I went to York and was just rooting around their charity shop, I picked up quite a few Rogue book purchases, and this one is another one of those. And it is One More Croissant for the Road by Felicity Cloak, which I believe is basically this author's memoir of her journey cycling around France, learning more about the process of cycling, travel, and also food, French food. Land of glorious landscapes and even more glorious food, France was a place built for cycling and for eating too. It's a country large enough to give any journey an epic quality, but with a bakery on every corner. Here you can go from beach to mountain, Atlantic to Mediterranean, polder to Pyrenees, and taste the difference every time you stop for lunch if you can make it to lunch, that is. Part travelogue, part food memoir, all love letter to France. One more croissant for the road follows the nation's taster-in-chief Felicity Cloak on her very own tour de France as she cycles 2,300 kilometres across France in search of culinary perfection. It's not the kind of thing that I would pick up usually, but it's one that I have seen floating around in bookshops. And when I saw it, it was at the charity shop for like £2, I decided gotta do it. Especially because I am cycling now. Maybe I'll find this a little bit more relatable? I don't know. <laughs> Something that definitely speaks to my soul is Why We Sing by Julia Hollander. This is a brand new non-fiction in this gorgeous, gorgeous hardback. And I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this justice. So once again, I am going to have to read the book for you. <laughs> As a singing therapist, teacher and performer, Julia Hollander is perfectly positioned to consider singing's importance to our well-being, charting its extraordinary influence on all aspects of our spiritual, emotional and physical lives. Why do parents feel compelled to sing to their newborns and how does it help their development? What is it about song that brings communities together in harmony but also in protest? How come an activity that helps to embed languages and maths formulae can also be used to rehabilitate long Covid sufferers? And what magic is at work when people who have lost the power to speak are still able to sing? By delving into her own life experiences and calling on those of her fellow singers, the author seeks to answer these questions, underpinning her findings with the latest scientific research. In the process, she provides inspiration for anyone who looks to sing. As somebody who does love singing, particularly musical theatre, this just really called to me. And even though I'd never heard of it before, even though it's like this brand new book that I've never heard anybody talk about, I just needed to have it. I needed to know for myself. Oh, we've got another rogue charity shop purchase, but it is one that I had been seeing in bookshops and thought, oh, that would be interesting to read one day. And apparently one day was during my birthday. And that book is Red, A Natural History of the Redhead by Jackie Collis Harvey. And this basically is about redheads through history. All of our common associations with being redheaded, famous historical and literary redheads. I just thought this would be really, really fascinating. And also I mentioned having some gorgeous, gorgeous photos. Ah. Yeah, this is very much one of those, it does what it says on the tin kind of books. So very interested to read this. A book that I picked up whilst I was in Haworth at one of my favourite bookshops, which is Waves of Nostalgia, was This Little Penguin Great Ideas, When I Dare to Be Powerful by Audre Lord. I've actually not picked up one of these Great Ideas books for quite a few years, but they have recently come out with a new collection of them in these beautiful light blue spines. And I believe these most recent collections are trying to kind of diversify this list, make it so that the Great Ideas list are not just this province of old white men. So I feel like Audre Lord's essays are a fantastic fit for this. And also because I was coming towards the tail end of history -a -thon, I thought what would be a better book pick than this? And yeah, these essays have just proved to be really fascinating, really powerful. Meditations on being a woman, meditations on being black, being a lesbian, and all sorts of different intersections that come with that. Once again, another one that I will be able to talk a lot more about in my history -a -thon wrap up. As I say, I did go to Haworth, which meant that I had to go to the Bronte Parsonage Museum because I can't go to Haworth without having a little look around there. And I feel like a new tradition that I've started to set for my myself is that I will go to the Bronte Parsonage around my birthday and I will always end up leaving having gone to the gift shop, having spent like half an hour in there and coming out with a couple of trinkets and at least one book. And this year that book in question was Charlotte and Arthur by Pauline Clooney. Last year the book that I read was Bronte's Mistress which was looking at Bramwell Bronte and his alleged affair with Lydia Robinson. This year I'm looking at a different romance, this time between Charlotte Bronte and Arthur Nichols, her eventual husband. I believe that this is majority set after all of her siblings have died so it is is just Charlotte and her father, though I am imagining there will probably be some flashbacks to earlier life. And I think that's really interesting. It's not a perspective that I have so far read about from the Brontes, aside from like the long sweeping biographies, but really they just tend to focus on the writing years. Charlotte, Emily and Anne all huddled around a table in their home writing and not so much about later life. So hopefully I will get to this soon and we'll have a new Bronte fiction book to chat about. I mentioned previously that when I went to the talk given by Alice Loxton, she was accompanied by another historian, who 
who I would mention later on and that time has come. The talk that I went to at Oxford Literary Festival was one with Alice Oxton and Dan Snow of Dan Snow's History Hit fame and they were basically talking about why history is still important, why history in all its many forms is still relevant and engaging and the new ways and new technologies that are being used to make history accessible and entertaining to all different generations. Alice Loxton particularly talking about her experiences as being a TikTok historian, Dan Snow talking about like the past 20 years as a documentary host, now a podcast host. They were selling both of their books at this event and I already had uproar but I did not have On This Day in History which is Dan Snow's book and it's one that I've seen around in bookshops and always thought yeah one day I will read that and once again I thought you know if I'm at his talk no time like the present. I also thought it would be kind of rude if I just went up and asked Alice to sign my book and then just didn't have Dan Snow's book. So I thought I'll pick this up now and I did indeed have it signed and it was a really really fantastic talk. I don't know if they recorded it whether or not they're going to put it out anywhere but it was it was really really great. I mean it is a bit of confirmation bias of the kind of things that I already think about history and the relevance and importance of history but yeah I loved it. I thought it was great and I'm looking forward to eventually reading this. And then the last book of this book haul but certainly not least towards the end of this month I had the immense delight and pleasure of going to Katie Lumsden's launch event for her debut historical fiction The Secret of Hartwood Hall. Katie Lumsden being Katie over at Books and Things. I was very excited when I found out that this was coming out and even more so when she did invite me to her launch event and I got to meet so many brilliant booktubers who I'd never met in person before and the launch itself was just so so lovely. So if you don't know already this is basically a Victorian historical fiction following Margaret Lennox who has been hired as a governess at this slightly creepy Victorian mansion. You can definitely see Katie's love of all things Victorian through this plot especially at to the Brontes. She actually read out a little snippet of this at the launch and it was just so atmospheric, so beautiful. So if all of her writing is as good as that then I am definitely in for a treat with this book. And once again isn't this just a gorgeous gorgeous book with the most beautiful beautiful end papers? And of course she signed it for me so thank you Katie. I know I've said it with every book but it is especially true for this. I am very much looking forward to digging into this. So there we go, those are all of the books that I ended up picking up or receiving in the month of March. I would like to hope that in April I am not going to have such an immense book haul but I also did kind of say the same thing about March and I, I mean I knew it wasn't going to be true but in theory April should be a quieter month. I think and I might be able to be a little bit restrained but I, I should never try and make promises because I obviously can't keep them. Do let me know if you've read any of the books that I've spoken about today. Alternatively let me know about anything great that you've picked up recently. I would love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye!